going to read the whole chapter. 1 John chapter 3. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifested, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that ye have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this word's, world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby know, hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are well-pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him, and hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Father our God, I thank you, God, for this day. Lord, I pray that you would be with uh, all of us. Lord, anoint our ears, Lord, anoint my voice, Lord, to do the preaching. And have us to receive exactly what you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Our, uh, here. Uh -huh. Yes, please. <laughs> we have one spare Bible. All right. What I'm talking about is 1 John chapter 3. In 1 John chapter 3... Uh, we continue this uh, story as it plays out, whereby John is expounding unto Christian believers deeper truths of the faith. I think often, again, I, I'll reiterate it, that we'll use 1 John 5, 7 as, as a gateway to the gospel, where we will say that um, these things have been written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and we leave it there, really. We is what we're doing. We're saying that you may know that you have eternal life. But that verse continues and says that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. In other words, the, the one that has eternal life should also be continuing in that belief, continuing to trust the Lord. Not for salvation. That's settled when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ once and for all. But we need to believe on Christ in our everyday walk and believe that he's continuing to work in our lives and strengthen us by his word as he promised. What we're talking about today in 1 John chapter 3, and I'm only going to deal with the first half of this about, is knowing whose son you are. 
Another topic, or another way to, to describe this, or a title would be manifest children. The Bible here in 1 John chapter 3 begins and it says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. The great love of God, what manner, what greatness, what type of love, behold it, that God hath bestowed upon us that we could be born again. Indeed, God saw the wickedness of men that it was great in the earth. Instead of flooding the earth like he did in the times of Noah, he continued to see that man's heart was continually wicked, continually set against him, and he decided to intervene in a different way than flooding the whole world. He sent that rainbow. He sent that bow in the cloud, which was Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, and he was the proof of the love of God in that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Jesus should not perish, but have everlasting life. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God, that we should be born again, have provision whereby we can have that spiritual birth. If you were to look in John chapter 1, keep your finger in 1 John, keep your finger in 1 John, flip over to John chapter 1. John chapter 1 and verse 10. John chapter 1 and verse 10. 12. You start in verse 10. It says, He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Verse 11. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. And this was actually what happened when, when God so loved the world. He presented his great love unto the world. And unfortunately, many, according to verse 11, and according to even what we saw yesterday when we were out sowing, many received him not. Verse 11, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. In other words, Jesus Christ, though he didn't knock on those doors in person yesterday, anyone who said, now we don't want to talk to you, now get out of here, here, was not receiving the provision that God had gave. God came unto his own, and his own received him not. But verse 12 says this, it says, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Continues and said, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of men, but of God. So when someone receives him, God receives Jesus, they are given power to become the sons of God. They are born again into the family of God. And as verse 13 says, this is not a birth that is of blood, as we were born to our parent, to our mother. This is not a birth that is of the will of the flesh. In other words, I can't will myself to be born again. I can't desire for myself to be born again. I can't want it so bad that I received it. No, you're not born of blood. You're not born of the will of the flesh. You're not also born of the will of man. When we go to a door and we knock and somebody says, no, no, I don't want to hear about Jesus. I can't conjure up enough will to force that person to believe on Jesus, though sometimes I wish I could. I'll say to some people once in a while, I'll say, man, if I could, I would grab you in a headlock and I'd wrestle you to the ground and I'd you know, give you a noogie, scratch you on the forehead and say, believe on Jesus, believe on Jesus. But the reality is, is that though I want them to believe on Jesus Christ so badly, the will of man does not save anyone. We are born of God, verse 13 says. Born of God. You, you can't will it. it. It's not of blood. It's not like this birth that we had when we came out of our mother's womb. It's not by the will of man. We are born of God. That's what it means to be born again. Go with me back to our, our text in 1 John chapter 3. Now we know this to be true. The second part of this says... What love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. And it says this, Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. So don't feel so bad when people reject you. The reality is, is that they don't know you because they don't know Jesus. They don't want you because they don't want Jesus. The world wants nothing to do with Jesus. The world knoweth us not because it knew him not. We don't need to wonder about this. We don't need to worry about this. We don't need to fret about this. God said, even in his word, he said, I bestowed my love upon them. I came unto my own, and my own received me not. 
And then yet, we sometimes get frustrated when we go to a door and we're just trying to tell somebody of the wonderful free gift of Jesus, and they say, no, I don't want any part of that. Don't fret people. This is exactly what God said would happen. He came unto his own and they didn't receive him. So when his own go unto others with that same message and they don't receive him, marvel not. The world knoweth us not because it knew him not. The Bible said in the previous chapter, it said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So if the world does not know us because it does not know Jesus, we should have the same relationship when it comes to the world. The problem with the Christian nowadays is that we know so much about the world. We know the world on an intimate level. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, we watch the world's televisions. We watch the world's advertisements. We, we, we listen to the world's uh, thinking way. We listen to the articles that the world presents. We're not to love the world. We're not even to know of the world. In other words, just as God is not known of this world, we should not know the God of this world. We should have uh, just as much of a push away from the world as the world pushes away from us. Think about this. We go to someone's door and we knock and we say, we'd love to tell you about Jesus. And they say, no, I don't want anything to do with that. Slam the door. But too often the world, when we flip on the television, says, hey, we want you to learn about lust. We want you to learn about murder. We want you to learn about stealing. We want you to learn about theft. We want you to learn about all these terrible things. And we don't say no, no, no and shut the door. No, we keep that television on. We keep that advertisement on before our face. We, we, we constantly are, are, are one with the world. We're letting the world into our house, and we're allowing the God of this world, which is Satan, to continually give us his message. It shouldn't be so. Just as much as the person in the world doesn't want anything to do with Jesus and slams the door, Christians, we need to, when the world shows up at our door, slam it in the world's face. We shouldn't be letting the influence of the world constantly speak to us in the same way. Love not the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in us. Don't receive that spirit of Antichrist. Don't embrace that false lying spirit that is of the world. We're different Christians. We're the sons of God. And the TV, the print, the advertisement, the advice, the influence of the world is constantly trying to get into our door. It's constantly knocking at our door. We need to slam that door. We need to close that door. Because we're different. The Bible says that we shall be even more different. Look at verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, right? Because he bestowed his love upon us. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So it's clear that we are. Now we are the sons of God. But there's something beyond that, that doth not yet appear what we shall be. But the Bible is clear that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. So in other words, how you are is one thing. How you will be is different in Christ. I believe that that's just the elevated version. But now we can live in that same fullness. When we see Christ, suddenly we'll be changed in the moment of the twinkling of an eye. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. And yet we get bogged down. We get in bondage. We, we have frets and worries and concerns where we're now. We need to do more to manifest who we are. Now we're the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. Now we are born again Christians. And yes, it doth not yet appear what it, we shall be. But we know that what we are now can be something greater than it was the day before. Look at verse 3. It says, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. And there's two parts to this hope. This hope is... In one case, pointing to the blessed hope, the glorious appearing, the return of Jesus Christ, when we shall be like him, when we shall be caught up together, those that are alive and remain, and meet the Lord in the air, we shall be changed at his appearing. This hope, this blessed hope that abideth in us, is one part of this hope. The second part of this hope, and is a little bit more of what I want to talk about now, is the... Is the 
Hope that he has given us the earnest of that. Okay, so what we see here we, is, is two things. We see now what we are, sons of God, and what we shall be. It's, it's unspeakable. We don't know what our glorified bodies behold. So what we are now, the sons of God, is Christians with the earnest of the Spirit that we have received, that hope that abideth in you. What you shall be is that when he shall appear at the blessed hope, the glorious appearing, he shall be changed and we shall be like him. And again, as it always is in 1 John, you need to divide these two ideas one from another. Because this book, this portion of scripture has been used so many times to teach a works-based salvation because it says things that, like, if you're in Christ, you shall not sin. It says that, the, that the, whoever commits sin is a servant of the devil, right? It gives all these types of allusions to doctrines that people could take and twist for their own devices to say that a true believer must not sin or doesn't sin. And I believe that is true. That the believer does not sin. But what are we talking about? Are we talking about what we are now? The son of God? The son of God? Or are we talking about what we shall be when he shall appear and we're manifestly like him? Or even what is in us now residing and pure and true and fulfilled? The sons of God, we saw, are not born of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of man. We are born because we have this hope abiding in us, the verse 3 says, the man that has this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. So if you have the new birth, if you have the hope of Christ's appearing, changing you in the moment of a twinkle of an eye, the Bible says here that every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as Christ is pure. Now, we're not going to be perfect. We're not going to be sinless. We know that the whole of scriptures teach that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that doesn't stop in the moment that you're saved. So what's happening here? What's happening here is God is describing two sides of the Christian. Essentially, the man that is born again, that has a risen spirit residing in him, has the earnest of the inheritance, which is this hope that abideth in him, that requires that that man purifieth himself even as he is pure. And the only shortcoming of that man is the fact that his flesh is still upon him. He's dividing from that Christian, that believer, from the man who is born anew, who will one day, who has received of the earnest of the inheritance, will one day receive that. And it is that new man, which is the spirit in him, that is alive and quickened and perfect and without sin, that the difference between that is that the flesh is here, but one day it will part. So one is the present reality. And yes, we need to believe that the spirit is within us by faith and trust that. That's the present reality, but we still have flesh weighing us down. The future is that you will not sin. You will be sinless. Even within your glorified body, there's a, there's a change, there's a resurrection that has to take place. And we need to maintain that these two ideas are separate. This hope drives us to be purer, even as he is pure. The Bible teaches that that that. God is making us into the image of his son. In other words, he is conforming us into his son's image. And the inward man doth not sin and is clean and is spotless. But currently we have an outward man that robes that, that does all sorts of wicked and bad and terrible things. And we can't get rid of that until we depart from this world. We need to be manifest what we actually are and allow what we actually are to produce in us good fruit which appears um, less and less filthy, more and more pure as the day goes on. And try to bring this together. Verse 4 says this, it says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So we see here the, the best or one of the best definitions of sin that you will find in the Bible. Sin is the transgression of the law. That is your definition for sin. In other words, when you transgress, when you break, when you do not follow, when you fall short of the law, you have committed sin. And so when I hear people that say that in order to be saved, you have to repent of your sin, 
If you take them to this verse, you say, so you're telling me in order to be saved, you have to turn from transgressing the law. Am I correct? And they won't, they won't give you that. Oh, no, they won't, they won't allow you to have that. But that's exactly what you're saying when someone, you say someone has to turn from their sins to be saved. No, when we get saved, we bring our sins with us to the cross and we lay them before him and say, hey, God, I'm, I'm unclean. I'm filthy. And the only way that I'm going to be clean is to be saved by you because you are perfect. You are spotless. You are righteous. Jesus, save me. Whatever your words are, that you would believe on him to get you into heaven. And when that happens, this hope abideth in you. The cleansing agent abideth in you. Well, what is that? It's the love of God that is the spirit of God that quickens the spirit of man, that lifts it up in order that it is not dead anymore. That hope abiding in you, the earnest of the inheritance, which will one day be perfect and settle in heaven, that is what abides in you. But then we look at verse 4 and we say, whoever commits sin transgresseth also the law. Sin is transgression of the law. And we see that as we read through the law, we break those every day. And so what's the rub here? What's happening? Verse 5 says, And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sin, and in him is no sin. So the purpose was that God would take away our sins. That was why he bestowed the love upon us. He desired that the sins that we have would be taken away. And the way that he was able to do it was because in him is no sin. So because Christ was sinless, he was able to bear the sins of all mankind upon him, nail them to the cross with him, carry them into the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, and leave them there. He was able to take away the sins of all mankind, but the only way we receive that is by faith in him. The only way we receive that is to have this blessed hope. We need to trust him. We need to believe in him. Verse 6 says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. And here's where we get confused because the Bible is constantly desiring that the Christian is constantly charging the Christian to abide in Christ. And then it says this, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever hath not seen him, or whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. So in context, what are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about, I believe, that perfect man, that new man. Okay, the old man is going to commit sin. He's going to transgress. He's going to fall from the glory of God and come short of keeping all the commandments. That's the old man. That is the flesh. Yet the new man, the Bible says here, is the one that abideth in Christ and sinneth not. And you can see how if we don't separate these two things, we can get confused because someone's going to come to somebody who says, I have believed on Christ, and they're going to say, well, you obviously don't abide in him because you're sinning. Right? They can use that against you. But we need to understand that these two things are separate. <clears throat> So the whosoever here in verse 6 in the context is that son of God part. This is the alive part. The part that was dead and yet is alive forevermore. This is the spirit that was quickened when we believed on Christ by faith. And this is the same spirit that hath that earnest of the inheritance within it, the Holy Spirit of God. And the hope is that one day... That spirit will rise up out of this flesh and later be reunited with a perfect flesh and so shall they ever be with the Lord. And that point, the whosoever abideth in Christ will not sin. Now, the reason why there is no sin is because it was born of God. Verse 7 says, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. And as you read down, it says, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this is the children of God, and this the children of God are manifested, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. So what this whole portion of scripture is teaching is the fact 
that the purpose of the Son of God, the reason why the Son of God came, was to destroy the works of the devil. The, the works of the devil would be the sin, the lying, the thievery, uh, the mockery, the hatred, all of those ideas that are improperly used to benefit self. Those are the works of the devil that God, the Son of God, came to destroy. The Bible says that whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. And here's the reason why. The new man, for his seed, remaineth in him. So the seed of God, the living spirit of God remaineth in him. He cannot sin because he is born of God. Even though in the flesh he will do wrong things, that seed that has been implanted in the spirit of the once dead man is risen is alive, is quickened forevermore, and does not sin. Verse 10 says, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. And it continues. So in that exact point, the fact that there is the seed of God remaining in the spirit of the living man, that is what manifests that he is the child of God. We're never going to see that with our eyes. We have to trust that by faith. In the same way, the children of the devil are manifested because there is something in them or a lack of something that has them so that they are bonded to the devil forever. And that seed remaineth in them, however that works. But how it will manifest to us because I can't see in someone's soul. I can't see in someone's spirit to understand if they're a child of God or a child of the devil. How we will see it is, how it says at the end of the verse, whosoever doeth not righteousness is, is not of God. Okay, well that's not a very good tell because we know that even those that are righteous can do wrong things. So what are we saying here? We're saying that the things that are spiritual are spiritually discerned. You're never going to tell if somebody is in Christ or not in Christ. You can look at their works, but you can never... Be certain of these things. But good news for the Christian is that we have been freed by right and reckoning from the sin that is within us. We don't have to sin even now in our mortal flesh. Well, that, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Are you trying to say we, we won't sin? No, I'm saying you don't have to. What I'm saying is that we have been freed from Sin. Romans chapter 6 is the best way of explaining this. I know it may be a, a cop-out leaving the, the passage we're dealing with and going to a completely different one. But Romans chapter 6 deals with this topic very well. <clears throat> In Romans chapter 6 you find described how the dead man and the living man interact. And how that somebody could be a sinner and yet still stand sinless before God. Look, look at Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so we see here the Christian has the choice to continue in sin or not. Paul asks this question almost rhetorically. He says, should we continue in sin? Well, just because we can sin, should we continue in it? Because we're under grace. Because the grace of God is going to cover those sins. Because God has made us sinless before him because of the imputed righteousness of Christ. Should we continue in sin? Well, God forbid. And the question is this. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Here we see in verse 4, we're also buried. And we are raised. And now when Christ raised incorruptible, the Bible teaches that we also raised with him. And that's how we have that perfect man in Christ that sinneth not. And so because that happened, that verse 4 finishes off and says, Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Because you've been given new life, because you've been born again, you should walk in that 
newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So what's that saying? It's saying that my old man, my flesh, my uh, mind, will, and emotion, my desire, my tendency to sin is dead. The Bible says here it's been planted in the likeness of his death. And yet we know that even today Josh is living, breathing, walking, talking. But the reality is, is that old man is dead. Okay, this is the right. This is what has been made true, okay, spiritually. Knowing this, our old man is crucified with him, continues to say, we should not serve sin. So there is a choice here. You need to choose whether you are going to serve Christ or whether you are going to serve sin. But remember, your old man is dead, and your old man is that tendency, is that desire to sin. Verse 7 says, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe we also shall live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. So the exchange is simple. Your old man was alive and well, while your spirit was dead as a doornail. And when you believed on Christ, the Bible says that the old man was crucified with Christ and the new man was raised up triumphant with Christ. Now they're both still there. And the Bible teaches that death doesn't automatically mean what we sometimes think of it, that it just ceased to exist. There's, no, there's nothing left of it. Death simply is almost like a dormancy. <clears throat> old man is dead and he needs to be reckoned to that. New man is alive forevermore, and we need to reckon that to be true as well. Because Christ is raised from the dead, because our new man is raised from the dead, death hath no more dominion over us. So we need to reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'll read verse 11 again. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord our Lord. By right, that is the truth. You are dead to sin, you are alive unto God. But practically speaking, too often we act as if we're alive unto sin, but dead unto God. We do sin, we follow after sin, we desire sin, and yet God gets the back burner. The Bible here is commanding there needs to be a reckoning, there needs to be a, a mind set to, there needs to be an appropriation. We need to reckon, we need to believe it true, that I am dead to sin and alive unto God. And when I do so, verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. That's a mouthful, but basically what we're teaching here, what the Bible is showing us is that you have the decision, you have the choice to make. Either you're going to reckon your old ways dead, your old man dead, and believe that you're alive unto God and follow after that, or you're going to live in the opposite way, where you are putting down God as if he never rose from the dead and lifting up your flesh and satisfying yourself. Verse 12 says you need to not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it. Neither yield your members as ministers, as, as in, yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But contrawise, we need to yield ourselves to God. And that's just a constant, everyday, moment-by-moment moment decision that needs to be made. You know the Bible teaches that the spirit lusteth against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit, and these two are contrary one to another. We need to decide that we're going to live and walk and talk and breathe in the spirit. And in doing so, you will not let sin reign in your mortal body. You will yield your members to God. And those members will be used as instruments of righteousness unto God. 
And that is how the Christian has victory in their lives. It's not because they've suppressed and destroyed and put down all of their sins and they're in a 12-step program and they're really going to do better. No, it's because they've decided that they're not going to yield to the flesh, but they are going to yield to the Spirit. And that decision happens each and every moment. Think of how many times even today where we've decided, oh, am I going to go to church? And you've had to say, hey, I am or I'm not. If you would have said, I'm not, you would have been yielding to the flesh. But if you said, I am, and all of you that are here did, you have yielded to the Spirit. You've yielded your members, you've yielded your body parts, you've yielded your consciousness as servants unto God. You made the right decision. <clears throat> Those decisions happen each and every day. But the reason why we have victory is because we have reckoned that, hey, that old man has no dominion over us. Verse 14 says, sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we, shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. And that's the rub. That's the decision that needs to be made each and every moment. We need to decide whom we're going to serve. Are we going to serve our old dead man? Or are we going to serve the living God that dwelleth by a seed, empowered by the earnest of the Holy Spirit within our living spirit? Know ye not that to whom you yield yourself service to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey. In other words, you can obey the flesh, gratify the flesh, satisfy the flesh, but then you will not be pleasing unto God. Then if you decide that day that you are going to gratify, satisfy, please, yield unto God, you won't be serving, you won't be pleasing the flesh. That decision has to be made, and that decision is yours. And in this is manifest the children of God. Now, because we have this infirmity, because we have this flesh that is constantly trying to fight us, that's why it is so important that we need to yield our members. We have this flesh that desires to do fleshly things, carnal things. It wants to eat to fill itself. It wants to drink to fill itself. It wants to touch to fill itself. It wants to do everything that flesh wants to do in order to please itself. We need to decide that we are going to take all of our members and yield them unto God in true holiness. And when we do, we are now the servants of righteousness. Now, like I said, the new man is alive, quickened forevermore, in truth and in spirit, and that won't change. <clears throat> the old man has that same new man dwelling in him, but has the ability to rise up again and do his own thing and, and sin against God. That decision needs to be clearly made each and every day. And when it is made, that is when the manifestation of who you really are comes to light. Verse 10, back in 1 John chapter 3, says, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. So we just read, Now are ye the sons of God. If we are yielding as the sons of God unto God, we're yielding our spirit, our members, as members and instruments of righteousness. We will show righteousness when we walk, the way we talk, with when we interact with people. How we live our lives will show because now as the Son of God, I have decided to live like a Son of God. The Bible teaches that we can even serve in the newness of that spirit. We can live unto Christ. We can love one another. We can love our brethren. We can do all the commandments. We can do all the things that God wants us to do if we are yielding ourselves, yielding our members as instruments unto righteous. Now are we the sons of God. And yet it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but when that shall come to full fruition, we shall be changed. And then... Then there will no longer be this choice. There will no longer be this free will opportunity to sin. The Bible is clear that when the blessed hope, the glorious appearing happens, then all of these truths will be brought to fruition. Death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, but thanks be to God, right? We are rejoicing in that day, the blessed hope that will one day come when we won't have to make these decisions because we will be as he is, like the Bible says in verse 5, in him is no sin. 
We will be that way. That will be our eternal state. We will never have to worry about sin having dominion over our mortal bodies. But Christian, you can decide today that that's how you want to live your life. As if sin hath no dominion over you. Well, why do you have the ability to make that decision? Because that is the practical, not the practical, sorry, that is the spiritual position that you are in. You are sinless. You are righteous. You are cleansed. You are whole. There is no sin in you if we're talking about the new man in the spiritual birth. But that flesh... It's going to creep up on us. That flesh is constantly going to lust against the spirit. That flesh is constantly going to try to bring us into bondage. And that's where this practically acts out. This is why we're in this state where we're constantly, just like the Apostle Paul is, in this carnal, fleshly battle, warring against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. And, and, and that's just how it is. That's just how we are. But if we want to manifest who we really are, then we need to decide today that we are going to yield our members as instruments of righteousness. And that has to happen today, and five minutes from now, and ten minutes from now, and twenty minutes from now. And every single moment of every single day, you need to make the decision that you're not going to satisfy flesh, but that you are going to satisfy, yield unto, seek after God to minister through the Spirit that He's made alive. And that is the manifestation of the sons of God in fullness. And when that fullness has been manifested, whosoever commits sin transgresseth the law, but your truth will be, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. So now, little children, abide in him. Now, little children, abide in him. That's John chapter 15. He says, if I'm in you and you in me, we have this abiding relationship. Now we can produce fruit. Now we can work righteousness. Now we can do goodness. And we can show forth the manifestation of whom the sons of God shall be. Yeah, that doesn't appear now. What appears now is the Son of God, a child of the King who is still tainted by the flesh, but one day will be cleansed, will be clean, will be whole. Let's manifest that now, Christian. Heavenly Father,